Hey, welcome. How are you feeling? Good. Pretty good. good. How's your slush been? It's very exciting. Perfect. Busy? A lot of people. <laughs> Akram, you were here on stage as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. I uh, just came back from the forest as well this morning. Okay. Yeah. They took me out on a trip to the Finnish forest. That sounds very nice. cool. Yeah. Ah, uh, they're really <laughs> Yeah. Okay, so Akram and Hugo, you are both entrepreneurs. Um, having witnessed all of these pitches and seen researchers who have amazing ideas, how do you feel as entrepreneurs? What does it take to take your research into a business? What kind of things does a scientist have to think about or kind of what kind of perspectives do they need to open if they want to turn it into a business? So, so, so I believe that uh, not every scientist should be an entrepreneur and not every scientist could be an entrepreneur. Uh, but definitely, if we want to have and to invent the next big leap in innovation and progress, it's not by doing the new uh, food delivery app. And definitely, we need some scientific background. Uh, I would say that the researchers and the entrepreneurs are both complementary. It could be the same person, but it could be complementary as well. Uh, so the, the scientist is here to explain and, and gain knowledge on specific topics, while the entrepreneur is here to make a solution for people. Uh, so I'm not a scientist. I'm actually I'm an engineer, but I worked with scientists to develop the product. Uh, some, of, some scientists could become entrepreneurs, or they can partner with entrepreneurs. Uh, and what is really interesting is when you, as an entrepreneur, you are obsessed about the users, the solution, and the product. Uh, so for example, we, we developed a, a sleep product for the consumer. Uh, it was based on a discovery where, where we saw that brain stimulation could enhance the quality of deep sleep. But then when you start to put that into the perspective of a product for real users using it every day, then you see all the difficulties of making that work. And I think these kind of two topics are really complementary to make a real solution that, that, that can bring something really new to people. Mm. Thank you. Um, I know, Akram, that you have also worked as a professor. How do you see the difference yeah. between being an entrepreneur and Yeah, it's, um, it's a very different uh, ecosystem. Uh, I was a professor, and I, you know, being in academia, I saw firsthand how you know, academics think. I was one of them. And you know, oftentimes, as a scientist or an engineer in academia, you're just very narrowly focused on your own research. Uh, publishing papers, uh, those are the incentive drivers, right? To publish as many papers as you can. Um, and you fall in love with your science and your technology. Um, it's very different than being an entrepreneur where you actually have to make something work and actually yeah. solve a problem, you know, provide a solution to a customer and find what that pain point is for, for that customer. So, you know, they're two very different worlds. One of the reasons I, I left was because I really wanted to do something that I felt could make a bigger impact. Um, uh, not, that's not to say that scientists and academics don't, don't do that, but it's, it's just in a different way, right? Um, so I think that's the main, the main difference. Yeah. Lou, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I, first, I'm very glad to hear two founders say things like, not every professor or scientist could be a good entrepreneur, because it's easier that founder understand it versus that the investor had to tell it to the founder. And my personal experience, I was a trained mature scientist and did a science-based healthcare company. And then now it's an investor investing in healthcare and also deep tech innovation. So sometimes I found I prefer founder have a strong technical background, even scientific research background. But meanwhile, I saw this. Um, I won't call it misunderstanding, it's the gap of the mindset, what is the right entrepreneur, what is the right researcher. Like for lots of scientists, uh, their whole career is looking for something best, the highest efficiency. But for something could work, not only the technology has to be better, faster, and also has to be cheaper, has to integrate with the industry. And I talked to founders saying that you have to work on something people need rather than people like. People like super fancy, super cool product, but not necess necessarily they're going to pay for it. So first, I'm very glad to hear the founder say that. And also, I hope more scientific background founder could understand the difference and be able to change their mindset before they make the decision to become an entrepreneur. If we think about a company at the very beginning of their, their career, so to say, um, is the best person to sell 
a science-based company, the scientist herself, or do they need a business person to be kind of the salesperson and not go in so deep into the topic? You've probably heard a lot of pitches from yeah. the companies. How does it differ? Uh, I would say not necessarily you really have someone to work on the BD, because I understand founder always think that I need someone with a totally different background, a salesperson. But to be honest, most of the science-based uh, company at the earlier stage, you don't really have a working product to sell. Most important, I think the, the, the founder has to find someone out themselves uh, could work on the strategy together, like to tell the full story to the investor, like now I'm working on this product, what is the true commercial application of this technology? Mm. Sometimes the science background, science background founder always talk about how awesome the technology is. Try to sell the technology itself. But technology not always make money. So you need to have the numbers, show the number to the investor. And the founder could calculate the number, and they could work with someone have a, the strategic mindset to think about what is a valuable, sustainable business model for this technology. What is a good commercialization application for this technology? I think that would be good enough. Not necessarily some professional salesperson charge super high price or some BD guy at the early stage. Yeah. How are these um, roles? given out at Dream, for example, how, how do the scientists and business people work together or? Again, I think together? it depends on people. Uh, I don't like the world like saying that a scientist should be with a sale guy. Nobody likes a sale guy, you know? Uh, but I would say that one of the quality as a CEO of a science-based company is to have empathy, understand users, uh, and put users uh, prioritary compared to technology or science. Uh, sometimes the scientists can, sometimes the scientists can't. Uh, in, in my case, we have, my co-founder is the chief science officer uh, and now the chief technology officer, so we have scientists. Uh, but generally, the CEO should uh, have in mind very well the product, the user, and the use case. Uh, personally, I think science is extremely important. Deep technology is extremely important if you want to unleash uh, really new innovation for people's lives. But this is not the end goal. The end goal is about user usage. Uh, and if this person can get that, it could definitely play that role. We don't need a sale guy. It's not about selling. It's about understanding your product, understanding your market, understanding your business model, and then communicate that to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes it can play that role, or sometimes it's associated with someone that will have the, the responsibility of the product, the application, the services, the solutions. Yeah. And in my case, Again, I'm not the scientist, uh, I'm engineer, uh, and I'm owning the product, the marketing strategy. I have a chief science officer and I have a chief technology officer. But obviously, in that case, the sale guy shouldn't be obsessed too much about only sales or product. He should be deeply committed to the scientific and the technological questions, because uh, the complex aspect when you start a company based on a scientific discovery is you need to find a use case. Generally, when you start a company, you identify a need, and then you build a solution. But most of the time, when it's about taking an innovation in the lab out to the consumer, you are doing the, the, opposite, the opposite way. So it's especially important to have someone uh, which is looking at what can we really do and what can we build that will be really useful and just not nice to have for the users. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, though, because um, we have research that is focused on delivering solutions, like applied research. And then we have basic research, which is more about finding new things and really um, innovative thinking without having that target audience or market that you're trying to reach. Um, how do these two kind of come together when it comes to science-based companies? Akram, you have probably been kind of in both? Yeah, so I think basic research is really the domain of academia. And I think that's one of the problems today that I see at least, is that people um, in academia are doing, are trying to do too much applied research without really understanding you know, how entrepreneurship works, how business works. And so academics really, in my opinion, should stick and focus yeah. on a basic research to make the discoveries, yeah. you know, as you mentioned, that can then become and turn, you know, spin off and turn into companies, mm -hmm. right? 
And I, I don't think there's a formula, right? There's obviously, there's obviously no formula to this, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one of the beautiful things about being an entrepreneur and also one of the hardest things, right? It really depends on the personality, right? So if you're a founder who's uh, maybe, you know, very scientific and really loves the science, um, you can still be, be the CEO and run the company, right? As long as you can, you know, raise money and you can sell the vision and find, you know, the, the users and, and, and the product market fit, as you mentioned. Um, and then there's also, you know, on the, from the business side too, I mean, that works as well. They, that person can come and help the founder and be, and be the CEO and, you know, uh, uh, build the company that way. But I think in the ideal case, you want a founder who um, understands the science, can also sell the business, because they're going to have the passion and the drive to grow it. Um, and so, you know, I think as long as they understand that basic science, leave that in the university, right? If you have a discovery, you've got to quickly turn it into a viable business. Mm -hmm. You've got to actually find a market or application for it. Don't fall in love mm -hmm. with the discovery because, you know, at the end of the day, it's survival of the fittest out in the, in the business world and you've got to make something work, right? Yes, so you're saying that an academics should kind of decide already early in their career whether they want to go into starting a business or whether they want to stay in academia and, and continue their research. Yeah, right. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that I've seen with my friends who have been through academia and then started companies is that sometimes the professor that they worked with will want like half the equity in the business, <laughs> which is crazy. They have a full-time job. They're working in yeah. a university, teaching, doing research. They can't, they, they shouldn't take half your equity, right? I mean, if you're a founder and you've discovered something that you think, and you're gonna devote 100% of your time to build the business, you should have the lion's share of the equity, not your professor, right? Uh, because he, he or she has their own day job, and building a company is super hard. Like, you can't, you can't do two things. Uh, I mean, I, I, I used to be a professor, and when I started Matrix, I realized really quickly that I had to either choose one or the other, right? And, and I decided, you know, I'm gonna put all my effort into Matrix, and I, I left academia. Um, there's just no way you can do both. I, I mean, at least I haven't found a person that could do both. Yep. Successfully. Yeah. Uh, I would say that, that uh, not necessary. You could now. I totally agree that uh, as a professor, as a scientist, it's hard to you running a full-time company. Meanwhile, full-time become a professor. But meanwhile, at least at Stanford, I'm a Stanford alumni. There's a concept we talk about: the scientist could consider become a pie-shaped uh, talents. So basically, on one hand, you still have focus on the academia. For lots of professors at Stanford, they have. Uh, the track of the research that focusing on publish the top tier uh, paper and the focus on the technology, maybe you're gonna be using the next 10 or 20 years investing into the future. But they also have other research project working with the, based on the interest of the student, kind of collaborate a lot with the industry corporation, like Apple sponsored, our Facebook sponsored, and then they are focusing on the solution related with the true use case in the real life. When that technology is ready, there are always tech transfer office, patent office at university. Either professor choose to spin off the company, finding someone from the industry to run the company instead of running it themselves. That's very important. All the tech transfer office in the university, they're going to put together a team, maybe student from the GSB, from engineering department, they put together this funding team. But importantly, I agree with him is, Professor could not be the majority shareholder of the company if he's not full-time running the company. Because from an investor perspective, I'm investing not only the company, but also the founder. If the majority shareholder or decision maker of the company is a part-time affiliate with the company, why am I confident about that my capital and my resources put into this company? So I found more and more professors at Stanford, although they are affiliated with like so many companies. Recently, I was talking with a professor at Whiteside from Harvard. He has more than 12 companies, like almost of their billion dollar exit. The way he worked on it is not he was running it. He has the company spin off. Maybe the professor only take less than 20 or 10% of the share. Meanwhile, they have this very good partnership between the research group and the company that the research group continue to do the research, potentially affiliate with the startup, act as an R&D center for the startup, but they got the government funding, they got the NSF funding. Meanwhile, they published the top tier paper. When the technology is ready for commercialization, they did an exclusive licensing deal with a startup company. Mm -hmm. 
So that's a very good and healthy, sustainable business model between the scientific research and startup. And also for the, for the scientists or professor, they don't need to worry too much that I have to make an early decision in my career whether I could only be a scientist or an entrepreneur. They could still try it out on the both way, but meanwhile has to try it out with a smart uh, model and a smart partnership. And let me just add, and yeah, I totally agree, and let me just add that oftentimes when you're doing basic science and you make a discovery and the company gets started based on that discovery, you know, nine times out of ten, what you started with will end up changing into to something yeah, totally different. Yeah, totally different. Right, and so that's what I mean. Like, you, you know, the, the entrepreneur that's devoting most of their time, you know, they, they need to be incentivized to, you know, you know, keep grinding and keep, keep persevering because the initial technology is never going to be this... Uh, you know, what it looks like at the end, right, so. Yeah. Um, if I may ask you, Hugo, do you have an experience of this with Dream that you have had uh, science that you have had to kind of take to another direction at some point? Um, so what happened at Dream is we started with a scientific discovery and uh, the two first years of the company we have been focused on the technological development. So we had this idea of stimulating the brain at night to enhance deep sleep. Uh, but then to get that to the consumer, it was mostly an engineering work. So make EEG, so the measurement of the brain activity, available to the consumer. So it was a technical question. Uh, so we kept, we kept contact uh, with scientists, uh, but the, for, during the two first years, it was really focusing on engineering. And then when we went out with the first version of the product, we started to have new scientific questions. We are generating tons of data. Today, we have one of the largest EEG repository in the history. Uh, we have more than 600,000 nights of EEG. So what do we do with that data? What kind of knowledge uh, can, we, can we do? And so now we have 25 laboratories and hospitals uh, all around the world working with us on these questions. Uh, and, and, and so now we have a scientific director, we have a scientific team, and we have collaboration working on that. So in our case, and, and I think it could be that, you know, you have the scientific discovery, then it's about implementation, execution. Maybe the scientific founder is less relevant at the beginning, but maybe it can gain back some weight in the future, and then, you know, have maybe a full-time position later on uh, in the history of the company. Mm. Yeah, that's... Um, I'm also wondering, um, in a company, for example, when, when you Lou, meet these companies, and I, I know that for an investor, the team is everything when you hear about the pitches and it's the people who really make it. Um, how much do the academic credentials play a role when starting or, or funding a science-based company? Is it also the, the amount of papers or the years you have behind you, or is it some other characteristic that you're looking for when you see a prominent science-based company? Yeah, so especially for the, because my focus uh, is basically deep tech and healthcare, like industry automation, network technology, most of this company I invested really required a founder has a strong technical background. So for us, when we value the company, not only founder is important, there are no matter technical background, scientific background is important too. Because one tricky part about doing science-based startup is, although yes, technology could be disruptive to the industry, but meanwhile, if the founder does not have comprehensive or enough understanding of technology, they may do something has a wrong timing, or maybe just play with the concept. For example, recently we heard the news about this gene editing baby, right? And uh, I feel for, for people really raising this industry, they know that gene editing is far away from commercialization. But the people, our founder, don't really have enough scientific background. They will think, OK, this is something we need to try. So from that perspective, we even prefer founder really have a comprehensive understanding so they know which level, which stage of the technology to could use now. And they could prepare for the future with more frontier technology, but they know the time is now right. And uh, when we talk with the founder, besides their, their understanding of technology, another important thing is as uh, back to your questions, it's same as we said earlier, also the other two founder mentioned, their understanding about uh, uh, product, product market fit. For example, we talk about artificial intelligence for the past few years, right? Yeah. But AI is not a new thing. AI was super hot back in 10 years ago in Silicon Valley, and uh, we have super awesome product at that time. 
but how come we did not see any huge AI company right now? It's because at that time, they did not really find a very good product market fit. The pro technology was kind of mature, but technology application cost was pretty high. Market integration cost was high. And the people does not really see the need why we're using AI instead of like, the, the existing solution. So the timing was now right. The product market fit was now ready. There's no window for the commercialization. Mm -hmm. So now we see lots of the opportunity came out. And another thing is to have tons of data being generating every day, which prepare for the AI application. So that's one example that not only they have to understand technology, they have to understand the market trend. Then they understand now is the right timing for us to put this product into the market. Mm -hmm. And which industry to choose to start with is also important. For example, still with AI, if you do lots of consumer-facing application, I am sure lots of people, their experience with consumer-facing AI is AI is not smart at all, right? But now we see lots of application for AI in healthcare, AI for industry automation truly show the full capability, our advantage of AI. So for founder, it's also important that he could show me that why I choose this industry to start with, why I penetrate into this market first, because we saw the potential for this technology to be go with the market to be mature along the way. So that's not only, that's the thing we also want to see from the founder. And other than that, we also want to see the founder uh, has the right understanding of the leadership, put together the good team. Because one thing I found very interesting with the technical background founder is, uh, for example, founder was a scientist, was a professor. They thought, OK, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to work on the technology product all day long once I start a company. But unfortunately, once you become the CEO, your full-time job in the first two years is fundraising, Building. recruiting, and strategy. Right. Nothing related with the technology. The first yeah. is the technology. So uh, whether the founder could find some co-founder, either take the role as a CEO, or take the role as a CTO to help on the product is also very important. Yeah. OK, so it sounds like you need to have a great understanding of what you're getting at if you're going to be an entrepreneur as a scientist. Um, what kind of um, things do you think we need to bring academia and the business world, especially the startup world, closer together? I think so. Uh, I was at the University of Michigan, and they actually did a phenomenal, uh, they had a great way of um, building a, an accelerator program within the university for spin-offs uh, from, from the laboratories. Um, I thought that was incredible. They, Michigan also, uh, was the first university before Stanford, believe it or not, to actually f take some of the money from uh, their, their, their fund and uh -huh. put it into startup companies based, uh, based out of research from the university. Um, so that was really forward lo uh, looking. Um, and then the, in, in, the U in the States, we have um, government programs like the NSF, National Science Foundation, that has actually started uh, entrepreneurship type of um, courses um, to, to help seed professors to start their own companies, to teach them about entrepreneurship, um, that sort of thing. So I think you know these types of things are really have been I think really helpful uh, to, to to help academics kind of transition into becoming entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, one last quick comment from Hugo on the matter. Yeah, so I think it's really important. Um, in my case, the company is based in France, as you might hear with my accent. Um, and in our country, most of the research is funded by the government and grants from the government, which means that the salary of a researcher is between 1,500 and 2,500 euros per month. While at Stanford, you can get uh, probably a salary around 10K. And, and it's important to say that because if we want to keep the best doing research, we need to put more resources. Yeah. And the government can't fund everything. It's impossible, right? Uh, and we, we can see that right now. So I believe that if we can bridge uh, the academic world, the research world, and the industry world, it will be perfect. But right now, we need more business people. We need more people that are used of building companies working in laboratories. So you have like specific uh, division of the laboratories which are looking at potential collaborations. And right now, it doesn't work. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's really important because you know sometimes we can hear we need to build the next Silicon Valley for France or for Europe. I think it's completely dumb. Uh, we are not going to build the next Google. 
but maybe we can build the next SpaceX, right? Uh, because we are really good at aerospace in France. So let's take that kind of problems. But uh, right now, some researchers believe that, you know, entrepreneurs and companies sometimes can be evil because it's about money. Uh, and you have people working in the laboratories for business which are not good at business. Uh, and if you change that, definitely it will be good because the success that you create from uh, the, value, the valuation of uh, innovation in the lab can then fund the research. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's especially important. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To all of you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you for a great discussion. Thank you. We'll continue later on at the studio behind the stage.